Now, some of you will notice, uh, you know, we're in a series called Third Down, Third and Seventeen. We're talking about relationships and how to not get behind in relationships. And some of you will notice that football up there is looking a little sad. And somebody reminded me, but it is a Patriots football, so it does make sense. It does make sense that it would be a little deflated. So, I don't know. It's a good way to make friends in this room, I know. I know. Hey, listen, our anchor verse for this series is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. It says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Last week we said, hey, listen, if you've got that one down, take the next four weeks off. So by you coming back, it just tells me you've got to measure of self-awareness, right? That, uh, that you know there's some work in this area. So uh, I'm excited you're here today to hear a friend of mine. I met Sammy last year and uh, just really fell in love with him. He's a, a neat guy uh, who loves Jesus, uh, who's a part of some really amazing and inspiring work uh, that I think will challenge you. And I don't want to say too much. I'll let him tell his story. But uh, Sammy currently lives in Bethlehem and grew up in Bethlehem. And his work there is in nonviolent reconciliation in one of the most violent places on the planet. And so would you do me a favor? Welcome my friend Sammy as he comes and shares with us. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it is a real pleasure to be with you today, but, but we're going to have a serious conversation today on many, many issues. Uh, and we will talk about the Holy Land and what's happening there. And, uh, but before, before I do that, I want to just make some things very clear to you as we start our day. Uh, Ryan actually, I was with him in this conference last week. I think some of you were there. It was an amazing conference. But he insisted that I do not get a ride to the airport unless I come to church today. <laughs> so this is why I'm really, really here. And I leave in a few hours, and I hope we'll be able to make it. Uh, uh, to the airport. Uh, a second thing I want to clarify, and, and we'll have this conversation today about clarifying some of the misperceptions and some of the myths that evolve around the Holy Land and the history of the Holy Land. But there is one issue that is very, very dear to my heart, especially as a follower of Christ, which is the division within the church itself on many, many issues, but in particular, the issue of what happens in the Middle East. And you probably know this very well. Some churches become very pro-Israel and what's happening for Israel and praying for Israel and cursing the Palestinians. And some other churches are praying for the Palestinians and justice for the Palestinians and cursing the Israelis. I know many pastors in the United States living in the same community that do not even talk with each other and cannot serve their own community because they're divided on an issue that is happening thousands of miles away. And I just want to say that today I am taking a very big step in coming into your church today. Not because of your politics when it comes to the Middle East, but to publicly declare that I was born in Kansas City. <laughs> and I have crossed the line to patriot country seeking peace and reconciliation with you <laughs> and humbleness and honoring the champions without any ill feeling towards you. <laughs> so if I could do this, we could actually create space of reconciliation in the church itself. I am a Palestinian Christian and I am a proud Palestinian. And when I usually begin by saying I'm a Palestinian, a lot of assumptions begin to take place in the audience that I'm speaking to. One assumption, which is actually true, that the Palestinians are Arabs, and we are part of the greater Arab community. My mother tongue is Arabic. When I'm home, I speak Arabic to my family, my children, and in my community. So that's true. But there's another assumption that many people have, is that because Palestinians are Arabs, all Arabs are Muslims. I don't know how many of you have heard this before. This is who the Arab community is. They're all part of one religion called Islam. And so it surprises many people to say, how can you be an Arab or a Palestinian and a Christian as well? 
and then the light blinks. Ah, he converted. He became a Christian, or his parents became Christians. So many times, after I finish a talk somewhere and there's a Q&A section, one of the first questions I get is, when did you convert? When did you become a Christian? And I'm always very happy to answer that question. And my answer is, I actually did not convert on the hands of some white American missionaries who came and converted me to become followers of Jesus or my parents. My conversion happened when my great, 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 great grandfather heard the disciples in Pentecost and became a follower of Jesus. 2,000 years ago. That's how far we go back. If you have any other proof, I'm ready to hear it. That's my story. And I want to make it also very clear as a fact that it was my ancestors that converted your ancestors, <laughs> not the other way around. So let's get these things done. The Palestinian Christian community is an existing community, and it is a thriving community, and it is a community that has remained in the Holy Land, has maintained the holy sites, has maintained the message of Christ in that land for up to 2,000 years. And I'm very proud to be part of that community, to be proud to be a Palestinian and to be a Christian who has an ancestry in the land itself. Now I want to share my story, and we don't have enough time to share 2,000 years of my story and my journey, so we're going to cut into the modern era of our story. And I usually began with a line that I would actually say many Palestinians and Israelis begin with their opening line when they share their story. And the opening line that most people use is, in 1948, many of you may know what happened in 1948. There was a war that took place in the land, and that war was a result of Israel declaring itself as a state, the Arabs and the Palestinians refusing this, and a war happened between them. Israel won the war, the state of Israel was declared as a victory for the Jewish people, and as Palestinians, we suffered what's known as the Nakba. The word Nakba means catastrophe. One group was celebrating, one group was living a catastrophe. It was the biggest mass catastrophe of a refugee population in the modern era per capita. 80% of the Palestinians, Christians and Muslims, became refugees. Over 450 towns and villages were destroyed. Now, when I used to share that story, it automatically fit into a narrative that many people have when it comes to the Holy Land. And that narrative is, this conflict has been going on for thousands of years. How many of you have heard this? They've been fighting each other for thousands of years. This conflict goes back to Abraham and his kids, Ishmael and Isaac. As if some genetic mutation happened to these kids where every day they wake up, kill each other just like robots, and then go back to sleep. And all the offsprings that came after them did this. So here's another myth we want to challenge today. This is not a historic conflict. This is not even a spiritual, religious conflict between the forces of good and evil. What many people forget is this little line when it comes to the Old Testament, when the two sons came to bury their father together. A reconciliation happened between them. In the Middle East, in our tradition and our culture, you cannot have two sons come and bury their father without them making peace with each other, without them reconciling. The clan, the community, the bigger family would completely reject two sons coming to bury their father and they're not talking with each other. Even if they had to be forced, they reconciled. So this is not a historic religious conflict that's been going on for thousands of years. This land has witnessed many conflicts like many countries around the world, and it has also witnessed many times of peace. And so when I begin now my story, I begin my opening line by saying, before 1948, what was life like in this land? My father was born in Jerusalem. He was born and grew up in a neighborhood that actually had Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together in peace. Not just peace, deep peace 
friendship and relationship. This is probably a story you've never heard. Jews, Christians, and Muslims in peace with each other in Jerusalem. This is actually part of our history. And I'm not talking about Christian Muslims and Jews who were nominal and said, let's put religion on the side. There's too much mess in it, and we're just liberal, progressive. Let's just get along with each other and, and not deal with the religious challenges. No. These were very religious, very conservative, very orthodox, and they lived together in peace. So one question is, what happened? As a nine-year-old child, my father, coming from a Christian background and what, the Muslim kids, actually used to go into the Jewish homes during Shabbat. Do you know what religious Jews do during Shabbat, which is Friday sunset to Saturday sunset? You're all right. Nothing. Silence. <laughs> That's what they do. They focus their time on being together and reading strip together and praying. They don't do any work. That's part of what Shabbat is, the day of rest. And so imagine these Christian families and these Muslim families to go into their homes during Shabbat, not to steal cookies from the cookie jar, but to do the tasks that these Jewish families were not able to do. Simple tasks like turning on and off the electricity or turning on and off the oven so they, that family would have a warm meal. I actually say that these people lived in so much relationship with each other as being so diverse that many of us who live next to our neighbors today do not live that same experience. Even our neighbors who may come from the same religious, ethnic, or racial group. We're not as close to our neighbors today as those were then. And so again, the question is, what happened? 1948 did affect us as a family. My grandfather, or the person who would have been my grandfather at that time, was killed in the war as a civilian shot by a sniper. My grandmother and seven children that she had buried their father in the courtyard of the house. The oldest was 12 and the youngest was two. Within a few days, when the Jewish forces came and took over that neighborhood, despite the protest of the Jewish families, all the non-Jews were kicked out we became part of the Palestinian refugee population. Moved into Bethlehem because my grandmother had a brother who was pastoring a church there. And like many refugees, they thought it would be temporary. That was 70 years ago. I share this story not to make you feel sorry for the family, but I want to share this story as a testament of a woman of faith, my grandmother, who took our faith deeply and seriously and especially in moments of crisis. You know, it's easy to be a Christian when you're in a comfort zone. And you could talk about the peacemaking, you could talk about loving your neighbor and loving your enemy. What happens to you when you are challenged? And my grandmother took this challenge, losing her husband, losing her home, losing her property, losing her future and the future of her kids. She always insisted that as a family, our faith, does not call us to revenge and retaliate against those who did this to us. She actually used to say, I don't even want you to find out who killed my husband, because if that person knew my husband, he wouldn't have pulled the trigger. Also, as a woman of faith, she also said that our faith calls us not to remain silent in the face of violence and injustice, that we are called to seek peace and reconciliation with those who did this to us. That was the seed that my grandmother planted in the family. I was six months old when we moved from Kansas City to Bethlehem, back home. My parents were living here. My father, as I said, is from Jerusalem. My mother is from Gaza. You probably heard a lot about the Gaza Strip in the news. I still have my mother's family live in Gaza. There's about a thousand Palestinian Christians who live in Gaza until this day. And my family is proud to be part of that community. And to be honest as well, I have to say, we have not been able to see each other in 20 years because people who live in the West Bank where I live and Gaza are not allowed to meet each other. So I grew up living all of my life under what we call occupation. You've probably heard that term. As a Palestinian, I grew up under what's called Israeli military occupation. Every aspect of our life was controlled by the Israeli military. Movement, access to resources, 
including water. I'll be honest and say, when I take a 10 to 15 minute shower here in the US, I feel guilty. <laughs> this is not what we're used to back home. Our water is limited compared to how much Israelis get water. Our movement is limited. I'm a US citizen. I cannot move around the Holy Land as you can when you come as pilgrims and tourists there because I'm treated as a Palestinian. As an American, a proud American, I grew up also with the rights that we all cherish so much, freedom, access to resources, expression, freedom of assembly, right of the press, right to vote to the people that I want to put in office, right to determine where my tax money goes. All of these basic freedoms were denied for us as Palestinians. And so it's a challenge for me, listening to my grandmother and my parents. As a nine-year-old child, I even challenged my father, how dare you ask us to make peace with them and look what they're doing to us. We can never make peace with them. They hate us. We hate them. It's war. My life began to change when I was 12 years old, when through an uncle of mine, I was introduced to that concept of nonviolent activism. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in the U.S., Gandhi and the liberation movement in India, and many other activists in nonviolence became the inspiration for my uncle, and he began to engage working with Israelis and working with Palestinians, and how can we end the violence? And when I say violence, it is violence on both sides. I'm not here to make one side look better than the other. There is demonizing, and there is hatred, and there is fear that exists in both of our communities towards each other. And I began my journey in the practice of nonviolence. Twenty years ago, I even started this organization that I run today called Holy Land Trust. And our commitment was to engage in nonviolent resistance. How can we get rid of this occupation through nonviolence? And if you asked me at that time, are you doing what Jesus is calling you to do? Before you even finish the question, I would say yes. And even, how dare you even ask me such a question? If Jesus was in my shoes today, if he was present in the Holy Land today, he would be doing exactly what I was doing. First of all, I would make the argument that I cannot see Jesus holding a machine gun or shooting rockets at anybody. I think we kind of may agree on this, all of us. And the second point is Jesus would stand with the oppressed against the oppressor, would stand with the marginalized against those who are creating the marginalization, would stand with those who are violated by those who are committing the violation would stand with the occupied against the occupier, would stand with me against them. And I made that argument once too many times for his liking, where he actually had to slap me on the head and say, shut up, Sammy. I do not stand against anybody. And I do not call you as my follower to stand against anybody. Who would Jesus stand against today? Nobody. How can he stand against peoples and nations that were created by God in God's image? And it took me on a whole new journey. And that journey led me to wanting to read the Bible, to really find out what this is all about. I don't know how many of you have read the whole Bible. Show of hands. Wonderful. So I decided to do the same thing. I opened the Bible from the beginning, read the first three chapters of Genesis, and then jumped to Matthew. <laughs> because it's much shorter and smaller. <laughs> but that was a God gift for me to begin to read Matthew. And I started reading, and very quickly you jump into Matthew 5, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm reading it as if I'm kind of memorizing it because I've heard so many sermons about it, but then I got struck by a verse that as if it jumped out from the Bible in my face, and three words from that verse, and my reaction was, Jesus, I wish you never said those words, and those words were, love your enemy enemy. Not even my neighbor. It's easy to love our neighbors, right? <laughs> kind of. Our enemy. And I looked back in the time of Jesus' life. When we talk about occupation, he was living it. The Jewish people were living under the Roman occupation, the rule of empire, Caesar. 
people were crucified for doing the most minor crimes on the streets of the Holy Land. Now, Jesus could have said to his followers, make peace with your enemy. Seek reconciliation with your enemy. Reach a peace agreement with your enemy. Negotiate a solution to the conflict with your enemy. And the Jews at that time would have been probably as furious with him as anything. How dare you ask us to make peace or reconcile with those who are killing us and destroying us? Jesus went beyond all of this. Not peace, not reconciliation, not agreements, not treaties. Love your enemy. And at that moment, I decided, if I want to follow this guy and his teachings, I do not have the luxury to pick and choose what I want to follow and not follow based on my own political agenda or ideological agenda. And sadly, many Christians do that. We let our ideologies and political agendas dictate our theology and understanding of Christ instead of the other way around. And at that moment, I said, I really want to understand what does it mean for me as a Palestinian living under occupation, living in the midst of this violence, when it comes to my enemy, to do only one thing, which is to love them. Many people come to the Holy Land for pilgrimage. I decided to leave the Holy Land for this pilgrimage. And I ended up in a place which is actually not holy, the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau, where the Holocaust happened. Many of you, I'm hoping all of you, have at least read or know about the Holocaust and what happened to the Jewish people. You know, it's easy for us when it comes to the enemy to label them by the actions that they do. As a Palestinian, I can stand here and give you a hundred things at least that the Israelis have done, acts of violence that they have done to us, which makes them the enemy. And a week from now, you could have an Israeli that can come here and give you a hundred reasons, acts Palestinians have done that makes them the enemy. And we buy into these stories. Of course, they're the enemy because what they've done. Most often, we label people by the actions that they do and never asking what is behind that action. We never get to know their story. Like Jesus and the Samaritan woman, he could have just completely judged her and condemned her for the action that she was doing. He went further. He gave her her history, her story. Most often, we don't want to know the history because we think that by understanding the history, we justify the act of violence. So, for example, if a person steals, what do we call them? A thief. They become a thief. We label them as a thief. We treat them as a thief. Even if they pay the price and leave the prison, we still look, ah, the thief. Be careful. He did an act. What if we begin to ask, what caused that person to do that? Maybe there's a point of healing that needs to take place. And in the healing is where the liberation and freedom really comes, for that person to stop these acts of violence. Maybe this is what the Palestinians and Israelis need more than anything. Not a treaty, not an agreement, but healing. In Auschwitz, I discovered the pain of my enemy the story of pain and trauma that caused the Jewish people to become so entrenched in the need to secure themselves from any people around the world. It's this existential fear and threat that I would say actually both communities suffer from. And I looked back in the Bible and I began to realize that this is actually what Jesus was doing. His engagement in peacemaking was in the act of healing. You know, if we read the Bible, there are two things that Jesus did the most, talking and healing, right? And I began to ask this question, why did Jesus heal? You know, as a child growing up in Sunday school, and maybe like many of you, we learn that Jesus was healing in a sense, it wasn't told us directly, but it was to show his power, how great he is, how wonderful he is. He was the Superman. This is the cartoons that we got in Sunday school books Look at me. Look what I can do. I can heal the blind. I can make the lame walk. I can even raise people from the dead. I am the Messiah. That's how I learned about Jesus in Sunday school. But at that moment, I began to realize that 
Jesus was never looking for some publicity stunt. He wasn't doing this to show how great he is. That actually, the reason why he was healing was his desire to make heroes from the people that he healed. The healing process is the process of liberating people from the constraints, physical, emotional, or spiritual, that did not allow them to live their life the way God intended that life to be lived. God has a plan for each one of us, even our communities. I would actually say even God has a plan for the Palestinian community. But if they're constrained by fear and trauma and hatred and resentment towards others, then they're not living the calling the way God intends this calling to be lived. That's why the Palestinians need healing. This is why the Israelis need healing. The healing is the act of liberation. When we are free from fear, imagine the things that we could do and how much fear constrains us. I want to share a story from the Bible that will make this clear, clear to you. Many of you may know or may not know the story of the blind man who used to sit at the footsteps of the temple begging every day. His children would bring him, his boys would bring him, and put him at the footsteps of the temple, sitting around maybe hundreds of other blind and crippled and poor people, and he would raise his hand, waiting for the smallest shekels that he might be given or breadcrumbs that he might be given, and then his sons would come in the evening, grab him, and take him back to the house. Every day, that was the journey. All of a sudden, Jesus sees this blind man, and he heals them. And what does this man do? He stands up and goes running to his home, to his community, to his neighborhood. Everybody knows that story, or most of you know that story. Now I'm going to share with you the version that many of you don't know. That's in my Bible, not your Bible. I'm joking, it's the same Bible, but I'm just, it's an addition to the story. That night, his family celebrated like it was 1999, it was like a party of the century. Imagine, like this blind man who was blind all of his life and his family and his community and his family had this big celebration. And when, you know, in the Middle East when we say celebration, you know, when you have your weddings here, you have 100, 150 people and you're like sweating, it's crazy, there are so many people coming. Our weddings are minimum 800 people and more. If you want to get married, come and get married in Bethlehem. We'll do a real party for you. <laughs> they had the biggest celebration. Any alcohol that they could find, they brought into this party to celebrate the fact that their father can see again. They were wasted, drunk, all night. He went to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning. He was so drunk. You know that story in the Bible? No? Okay. <laughs> what was his wife doing at 5 a.m.? She had a stick, she was banging him on the head and say, get up and get a real job, you dumbass. <laughs> I said it again. <laughs> Sorry, it's a church. <laughs> Forgetting. <laughs> it's an Arabic word, don't worry. <laughs> it means nice person. <laughs> Get up and get a real job. You're no longer blind. You're responsible. You're free. You're so dumb. You actually ran in front of all the people. You can't even go back and fake blindness anymore. <laughs> now you have to earn a living for your family. You are responsible. You're free from the trauma. This is my prayer for the Holy Land. How can we pray? a prayer of healing for the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians that live there, Palestinians and Israelis. It's not about whose biblical right it is to be there and who is not allowed to be there. God has placed us all in the land for a purpose, whether we like it or not. We all have a history in this land, we all have a desire to be there, and we all have a future. My request to you, is to try to find that place of tension in the middle. When we hear the word Muslim, 
We could think of all the actions and acts that many Muslims have done, and it's not even close to being the majority of the Muslims, and we could label all Muslims as those people. And many Muslims, when they think of Christians, ironically, they think the same. What Christians have done to us, the acts, and the Jews, the same. How can the church be in that place of tension in the middle of being a peacemaker? Not about political agendas, but about healing and reconciliation between our communities. This is a prayer that I ask you to pray, but I'm not asking you to come there and do this work because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this land as well. A lot of healing that needs to take place even within the church itself. So don't come there until you start doing the work here. And you can say, well, who, I don't have any enemies. Nobody's threatening me. I'm actually living a good life here. But think about it. Who are the people that you ignore? Family members? Who are the people that you shun away from and don't interact with? Ethnic communities? Who are the people that you talk behind their back when they're not there. Or even worse, you know they're talking about you behind your back when you're not there and take a step and going to them and say, let's fix this. These are our enemies. For me, I say the next revival in the church is going to be that of peacemaking in the church itself and the communities around us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you for every opportunity we can come together in your name and in the name of your Son, born in a manger in Bethlehem, crucified on the cross and resurrected and is up in heaven, looking down at us. And wondering and asking, how are we following his teachings? What are we doing every single day of our lives to live the life God intended for us to live? I pray for this community. I pray for this church. I pray for every single individual who is with us today. May we all be healed from any fear that we have towards others, any rejection we have towards others any ill feeling that we have towards others. May we understand that people are not their actions, but people are stories of pain and suffering that need healing. There is only one way to deal with this fear, and it is love. And you have loved us and sacrificed your life for us, even in your moment of fear, from being put on the cross, you said, I give up to you, O oh God, everything. And may this be our prayer. In our moments of fear, we surrender all to you. Make us peacemakers for your kingdom on this earth. In your holy name I pray, amen.